Okay, what's going on, guys? And welcome to a brand new episode of Inner Choice. Ross, introduce the guests, man. Today, we've got some of the best Roman names in British MMA media. We got Jake Jones and Mike Gomes. Guys, how are we doing? All good. good thank you, mate. All good. Man, how names. easy was that for me with those names? <laughs> it, was, it was like, they just roll off the tongue, they did. Roll it's off a boy tongue. band waiting to happen, you know what I mean? Where's Simon <laughs> Cowell when you need him? But, uh, <laughs> on today's show, we have the two lads on. We're going to be going over everything from UC 259, the highs, the lows, everything. And this weekend's UFC card as well. It's going to be very exciting. So if you are new to the show, make sure to like and subscribe before we carry on. But Ross, where exactly do you want to start? Why don't we start with UFC 259, the countdown? Did you get any texts over the weekend, Basmo? <laughs> Uh, funny place to start. Yeah, for people that weren't aware, myself and Ross were featured on the UC259 countdown video. Uh, it was actually amazing, to be honest. Um, it was good to hear Ross's voice on it, but uh, we might be on another one. So uh, if you do like these videos, there is higher chances we'll be featured on it as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, the UFOs see have their eyes on us. So, lads, therefore, they have their eyes on you. So uh, <laughs> That's you know, true. No that- pressure to perform today, lads, you know. Yeah, and I will. We will wait to the very end to let the two lads uh, plug their stuff as well. So make sure to follow the lads as well because they're doing great work. But uh, also, we did release a new feature on the show called Energize the Face Off. We had two fights on. Make sure to check them out. We're going to put them at the very, very end. We had the two girls, we had the two guys. So if you're a guy or you're a girl, you, like it's going to fit either one of your niches. So, Ross, we started at the very, very top. Yeah, and um, Jan Blahovic defended his UFC light heavyweight title against. Israel Adesanya, and um, there is many talking points uh, about this about this fight. And I'm just going to start off with the fact that this fight was built for Israel Adesanya to win. UFC wanted Israel Adesanya to have both belts. They wanted him to ha- be known as the next champ, champ. But uh, Jan Blakovich had different uh, ideas, and not only that, I think. You know, he was almost disrespected from a skilled standpoint coming into this fight. And let's be honest, Jan stood toe-to-toe with what is the consensus best MMA striker in the world. And he beat him. He outstruck him. And on top of that, he then decided for round four and five, he mixed in the grappling. And look, he exposed a massive hole in Israel Adesanya's game. Israel Adesanya against the fence, brilliant takedown defense. Israel Adesanya on the open mat, did not offer much defense to those takedowns. Um, first things first, uh, we'll start with yourself, Mike. I just want to know, what did you make of the scoring? Because I sort of thought maybe Izzy might have got two of those rounds of judges scorecards, but he didn't. What did you make of the scoring? How did you score it? I had it first and third for Adesanya, quite obviously fourth and fifth for Plachowicz, and the second round, upon first watching, as an Adesanya round and as upon second watching as a Blachowicz round. So do you originally then think that Adesanya still had a chance of getting his hand raised when it went to the decision? I, as I say, on first view, and I thought it was Ades- it was an Adesanya uh, win, three to two. I didn't, to be quite candid, understand the 10-8 round. Um, I thought that was a little bit harsh because I thought Adesanya had success early. Um but I was quite surprised upon watching it first time round that it wasn't an Anders- an Adesanya win. What about you, Jake? Yeah, I, I think I, I agree with the ten eights. Um, I don't think it was an absolute battering for them two rounds. Um, and I think that we've seen we've seen ten eights go in the past where you've gone well, surely then you've got to take more points off them. Um, we've seen rounds that have gone so one sided, and I don't think that was particularly the case there. Um, but. At the end of the fight, for me, Blasiewicz had won it anyway. Um, I think I put it 48-47. So once more, uh, the second and the uh, sorry, the third and the thir- uh, first and the third round to Adesanya. Um, I thought Blasiewicz played it amazingly, really. Um, and I think that was the one thing kind of Adesanya said is he expected Blasiewicz to come in wrestling from the start, and then when he kind of filled him out for three rounds on the feet, then taking it down on the, in the fourth and the fifth was just a perfect game plan. And I think. They were the two rounds in the entire fight where you went, yeah, that's the definite round that you go, yeah, they're definitely to this person um, or to Blasiewicz. So I think for the rest of the fight, you could argue it either way, but uh, the fourth and the fifth were what cemented everything throughout the fight. Yeah, don't forget at the very, very end, like if there had been another 10 seconds, I think Adesanya was going to be finished as well. So it would have been weird to be like, the winner is Adesanya, even though he just nearly lost. 
But uh, I wasn't expecting the scorecard to year, lads. It was um, it was crazy. But Blackfish got the win. He fully deserved it, especially the shot he made in the last round. It was so time to perfection. It was uh, it was a championship takedown. Yeah, champion, re- champions takedown. It re- it really really was, you know. And I think as Jake alluded to, when it came to rounds four and five, he shored up those rounds in the championship rounds, and he got the job done. Um, I think one thing that Israel definitely underestimated was the size advantage. Uh, when it came to the grappling, like he looked like a, a shark out of the water there. There was there was no defense or, or no offense offered off his back. He just sort of lay there. He he looked like he was doing a bit of you know a hip thrust or something at one stage, but he off, he offered nothing off his back. And once I think Jan saw that in the fourth round, he was like, right, round five, I'll do the same. And you know he was he showed the higher fight IQ in the fight and he got the job done. So I think, you know, it might be an obvious question, but we'll go to the lads on who's next for Jan Blakovic. <laughs> I am not, I'm going to deviate from the census quo and I have a funny feeling and a few rumblings I'm hearing that it might be Alexander Rakic. And from a marketing standpoint, I can see the sense in that, but we would all, it would all feel pretty hollow if Glover never got that, that opportunity, I think. I totally agree. I think Glover literally needs that shot now. Um, I think he's done everything to deserve it. I think it's the fight that Glover and Jan are these kind of people who you just can't hate either, where they kind of market themselves, where they present themselves. They're brilliant. So it's going to be, for me, it might not, from a marketing perspective, have that fire that you kind of want, but there's no doubt they both deserve to be there, um, and that's why the fight should be made. And we've got to consider where Glover's at now. If he takes it, if um, Blasiewicz takes a fight with Rakic, then how long does Glo- uh, Glover have to wait for the next fight? And potentially, if he gets a fight in between that and loses, then we might not see Glover get that shot. So I think um, don't do him dirty, and he definitely deserves that shot. Basmo, did you ever think, uh, just say, well, I'll fire back two years to 2019, that we'd be talking in 2021? Jan Blakovic versus Glover Teixeira for a world title. I think if I said that to you, you would have probably said the Bellator world title. Yeah. No, no, I'm really surprised. Um, it's just slightly unfortunate the way Blakovic can't actually bring the, the title fight to Poland, which would be amazing. And like, that's like, I know as the sort of like Australian, New Zealand fans, they'd be a bit let down. Adesanya didn't become champ champ, but it's like one. I was one person's stock lowers and other person's rises. So like Blackwich is now definitely going to be seen as like, uh, like an icon in Poland. He has to be to see the way he was treated when he arrived home from uh, to Poland for the training camp. It looked unreal. And like uh, Poland been looking for someone ever since uh, Joanna lost as well. So um, not Jan fully deserved it. And the, uh, he, he just came across as a really cool, funny guy. Like he just, uh, I, I, I'd love to go to Poland to go see him fight. But uh I think Glover is the man that deserves it next. But like, as you know, somewhat a light heavyweight could come out with a massive win and then he skips the queue. It's all about what you did like la- mo- most recently rather than like, oh, do you remember he won six months ago? Yeah, well, like, look at it this way. He was, what, he's now nine and one in his last 10 fights. And like, I think when he first came into the UFC, he went two and four in his first six fights. Like, that doesn't really happen to anyone. You know, if you come in and lose four of your first six fights, like, you know, you're probably considered never making into the top 15, but he's only yeah. fought top of the range guys. Also, Joe Rogan made a mistake uh, after the fight that I'd actually made myself previously. I actually assumed that Jan Blachowicz fought a uh, uh, middleweight at some stage, and he never did. I, I don't know why I had that in my head. But you said maybe... he did it about eight times. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and like, uh, I was like, I-, I think it's because he fought so many people who have fought at middleweight, like he's fought Devin Clark, he's fought Jared Cannonier, he's fought Luke Rockhold, he's fought Jack Rice Susan. I was like, he must have weighed around the 185 pounds as well. But seeing him in there and seeing like him put you know him put that size on Adesanya, you can actually tell he, he's a much bigger man. I think as well, height. of the five um of the five attempts to become champ champ, this is actually the biggest what well, the second biggest disparity between weight. We obviously had TJ go down 10 pounds. We had Cejudo come up 10 pounds. We had McGregor come up 10 pounds. And DC obviously went back to heavyweight. This is the biggest, second biggest jump, obviously, of 20 pounds. So I think the weight and a natural 205 at Adesanya not having that reach was a big disadvantage for him. Yeah, and definitely to play on that point, Mike, I'd say on fight night, 
Adesanya probably weighed as 200 and one half pounds. Now, Jan probably weighed about 220. Now, when DC went up and fought uh, Stipe from Champ Champ, I actually think DC actually weighed in heavier than Stipe first time out. <laughs> Doing it for dad bods all over the world. <laughs> dad bods represented. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, okay. So Jan looks like probably three of us think he's going to fight Glover next. Mike, you think he's going to fight uh, Rakic next. What does Israel Adesanya do next, lads? Go on, you go what? first, Jake. Yeah, defends the middleweight belt. Um, but but against who? It's a tough one. Um, and and how much has the stock dropped? Like how much are you looking forward to seeing uh, Israel Adesanya fight next? I'm not gonna lie, you like oh, my, for me like he'd be a nine or a ten out of ten person. I'm like I'm I'm pumped to see it now. I'm probably down out of seven. I'm like. I don't know, like, there was a good few holes in the game shown. I think there was, wasn't there? Was mm. I, th- I think it really depends what fight is made, because I, I still think Adesanya said it a few times about daring to be great, and I think he did do that. You can't blame him for going up, and and one thing we haven't really seen in previous fights with him is his ground game tested properly. We've seen him against people like Gaston that way. He, he's had some grappling exchanges, but we've never seen that happen with, with what happened with Blasiewicz. So, I still think, striking-wise, though, we can't rule him out as as oh, an exposed mixed martial artist now. Sometimes you don't need to have that all-around game to be someone like Adesanya. His, his striking is phenomenal. And um, I would be interested, Is it was it Whitaker Costa's uh, lined up now? Yeah, that's on the same note as Jake Paul versus Ben Askren. Yeah. So, obviously, I think the winner of that is the obvious answer to say that that's who Adesanya, Adesanya should get next. For me, I've said it countless times now, Whitaker deserved that rematch. Um, I think he's done enough to prove that he can get there. And, and, and I think that would still be an interesting, good fight. Um, but yeah, as I said, for me, I think Adesan just goes back down, defends the belt, and he, for me, his stock hasn't lost at all. Um, it hasn't majorly depleted. He's still one of the most entertaining fighters, and um, I think he did dare to be great. He didn't pull off, but uh, I, I think he put on a fight that, that, or put an event together that we all wanted to see. And what about you, Mike? What's next for Israel? The last stall bender, Adesanya. April the 10th, we have Darren Till versus Marvin Vittori. April the 17th, we have Robert Whittaker versus Paolo Costa. My belief is there will be an unofficial four-man tournament without a, fin- without a final, if you like, and the most impressive of the four will get the shot. If Whittaker beats Costa and looks more impressive than Till or, Vittor- Till or Vittori, that's a rematch we all want to see. Darren Till sells tickets, so that the UFC will probably want that to happen, and Marvin Vittori, there is the obvious storyline of the rematch. If Costa gets it, I would presume they will go with the winner of Till and Vittori. Basmo, what are you looking to see? That was well said, by the way. Um, Ross, I'm going to bring it back to, remember we had Jack Manson on the show and we were like, we think he's the one chap that can actually do what um, Blackfish just did there. And um, I can't believe he went the last that fight, but um, just looking at the rankings now, obviously Mike's just covered some of the fights, but um, tickets-wise... Darren Hill versus Adesanya. And obviously Adesanya wants that fight as well. But it seems like the wrestling, like everyone's like, right, get into the wrestling class now, like if you want to win the title. Whitaker doesn't seem to really want to fight Paolo Costa. Like no one wants to see that rematch. So yeah, I'd go Darren Hill and Marvin Vittori. Vittori is also like uh, re-energized his career, you'd say. So uh, Till, Vittori, and we cannot forget Kevin Holland, who's fighting Derek Brunson. Saturday week as well. Yeah, the middleweight division is probably hotting up more than ever. And I think um, Adesanya taking that quick break, going up to light heavyweight, that sort of opened the floodgates for anyone to sort of call their shot. Um, I do think Till uh, could end up being the front runner because I think Costa versus Whitaker could be a very tight fight. And it could be end up being a sort of a you know, 29, 28 decision going either way, as opposed to... You know, Vittori has looked very, very good he, he, in his last fight. Um, you know, he's no easy feat for Darren Till, but, you know, Darren Till can, can get a win and get on the microphone. You know, who knows what will happen. One thing I will say about Adesanya is, uh, I don't know, I felt like it was a bit harsh when I said his, his, his stock is lower. But, uh, very harsh. I do, think, very harsh. <laughs> I, I do think if he does win two or three more fights in middleweight, he could go for champ champ status again. Yeah, you um, said that there yesterday as well. By the way, just yeah. to back you up there, you know. Yeah. But... <laughs> I, 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 w- I, w- I wouldn't rule I wouldn't rule that out. But um, I I I think in terms of style wise, 
of the four guys who are fighting over the next coming weeks in the top of the contenders, I actually think the Vittori rematch is the hardest match for Adesanya. Would you say, lads, that maybe if Adesanya wanted to fight for the title again at light heavyweight, he'd almost have to fight someone else first, a number one contender fight, because he's, he sort of just jumped up to that division, and there's obviously a huge difference. What is it, 20 pounds? Mm. So, like it's hard to really put on that extra bit of size, especially 20 pounds. Whereas like people thought it'd be hard for the likes of McGregor to go up 10 pounds, you know, but do, it, do, it, do you think it, he needs not... a number one contender shot if he's going to go up again? I don't think it's just that because I think not only like, I don't think he makes walks around at 205 and the guys he's fighting walk around at 225, 230. So I think he needs to bulk up to minimum sort of 210 walk around before he even looks at going back up there. So but, would you say he'd have to vacate the title and then go up and make a proper run, sort of John Jones style? Potentially so. Potentially Jake, he needs Jake, to Jake, take Jake, the time. Jed's, I, uh, Jake's nodding his head there. Yeah, I, I think you, you, he's obviously had this shot now. It put on a super fight, but now it's at the stage. That if he went back down, say, defending his belt twice, you still can't argue that then he would get ahead of these light heavyweights who, who are in the rankings. So, yeah, I think he would, if that's a challenge he wants to do again now, um, then he's got a. He will have to vacate the 185 pound title. And we've just been speaking about some of the stars in that division. There's no doubt that the UFC will go. Yeah, cool. There's there's enough people here that we can put on a great, great little tournament. But then, as I said, if if Adesanya is going to step up, then I think he would need to vacate that belt and see it as more of a a personal challenge for him, in opposed to getting the double champ status. Okay. Got my opinion. Champ yeah, now is the is the trendy new thing, isn't it? That is Conor McGregor made it, and it's just the trendy thing. And I don't know about any of you, but I remember when TJ got beat by Sahuda, I remember the feeling really lackluster because the whole point of Champ Champ, I think, is it's set up for that it's set up, you know, to see the two belts and you know to become the Champ Champ, if you like. It's a little bit of a strange feeling when the person doesn't accomplish the goal. Having said that, the style bender is. I would argue one of the most marketable people in the UFC. And if with two or three more title defenses at middleweight, I don't know if the UFC would wholeheartedly pass that up a second time around. Yeah, and also I think if you look at the names at 205, none of them particularly stand out as being very sexy and none of them stand out as being a superstar there. They're they're all almost like, even though John Jones hasn't beaten them all, you know what I mean? Everyone just looks at that division as like, yeah, if John Jones came back, though, it'd be still his division. So until one of them comes a star, you know, it, it, you know Israel Adesanya going up there will still be the A side, and I think that's part of, part of the things that will play in his favour. But uh, but yeah, also oh, Ross, also but, Jan's win also like <laughs> like like certifies him as the proper champ as well, taking the yeah. O off Adesanya as well. So like it, it brings a bit of um, uh, certification to the to the light heavyweight division as well. Absolutely, um, but. Let's go on. I just want to say, can we all just appreciate the politest exchange between them when uh, when Adesanya eye poked him? He's, I'm sorry, no, 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 it's it's fine, it's fine. And they were literally <laughs> like, <laughs> I think that was kind of a weird thing because Adesanya obviously has always had that quite, um, he's been quite sharp with his comebacks and he's, he's got that character mm-hmm. to him. But against someone like Blashevich, you don't really want to be like that. So it was that moment of like, yeah, yeah, I'm genuinely sorry here. And then Blashevich is just the nicest person about it. It's, it, it was a, uh, it made me chuckle. Yeah, I, I, I love this sport, man. There was a moment at the end as well after uh, after Jan was announced the winner. Uh, Izzy goes from great guard, man. He goes, you want me to be bodyguard? I was like, <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 you know what? I was, I was saying to Baz that like he's actually, you can see for a while he'd be very underappreciated as champion because he seems so easy going and seems to be ha- look for such little fuss that you y- almost, you know, can forget about him because he, he he doesn't walk around like a star as opposed to like Stolbender. I'm sure if he walked into a room, all the heads would turn. But uh, that's just who he is. Yeah. But uh, speaking of stars, let's have a look at the women's goat, um, Amanda Nunes. Basmo, what did you think of that absolute assault? Um, I'm not shocked to be honest. Like, um, even in the build up, we saw like the way I've never seen someone like never ever ever let go of their child. I'm not saying there's something wrong with it. I'm just saying like it's just like. She's like, this, everything is for you. All this training, all this blood, uh, blood, sweat, tears. This is all for that child. And like Megan Anderson, she said she was going to be the first featherweight to really give her a challenge, even though Chris Soiberg obviously did that as well. But uh, Amanda Nunes, where does, it, where does she go from here? That's like, that's where we really have to take the spin on this, lads. 
Go on, uh, Mike, you give us uh, your lowdown there. I will be, I don't, I will be quite candid. I didn't pick Anderson to win, but I looked at a couple of the um, attributes of Anderson, the reach and the height and relatively good striking. And I also had the birth of Nunez's daughter in mind. Is it, it is a daughter, isn't it? Am I right? Yeah. I'm saying that. Daughter Reagan. in mind. And I just wondered if it could be one of them moments where she falls off, you know, sleepless nights with a, with a newborn and all of that. But to me, it's getting a little bit like Mike Tyson, where it's almost becoming an... I don't want to be disrespectful, but it's almost becoming like a non-event where it's... There's a handful of names who may even look competitive. And the two that come to mind for me would be Shevchenko and Durand, both of which are rematches that she's, she's already won. So we are getting to a point now with Nunes where it's almost, it's to be, to be candid, too easy. What do you think, Jake? Uh, I partially agree that uh, I don't really know where she goes next. I think Shevchenko is is the best match up there because I think Shevchenko is given the closest fights. And every time we see Shevchenko, I think she also has that dominant fact that you go, I don't really know what else she can do. So that would be probably, that would be their trilogy, wouldn't it? Yeah. Which yeah. would probably, it, market-wise, it would still make sense. And I think it's a good fight. Um, I think in the build-up to the fight, I had always said that it was going to be quick. I, I thought it would be in the first minute. Um, and I think, Ross, you were saying that you look up some stats, it's something like every three strikes that Megan takes, she, she delivers one. I think that's something we've seen throughout the fights anyway. Her, her and something that I spoke about was her striking defence is quite open. Um, and against someone like Nunes, you cannot do that. Um, and that's exactly what we saw. Um I don't think you're being disrespectful, Mike, when you say it was it was a non-event because I think that's something that had been circulated in the UFC as well. Um, Joe Rogan was saying it and that it's it's not disrespectful. It just unfortunately is the situation that that, that the fight was in. Um, but yeah, for me, I, I would say Nunes stepping down um, into the bantamweight division again and defending the title. And if not, I do think with the birth of her daughter, with everything that's going on, I, I think potentially she might retire at some point and then maybe take a two-year break maybe come back if there's another super fight that can be made. But um, when it gets to the stage, where else is there to go? Maybe some time off for her would be another option that she's happy to take. Yeah, I, I actually thought maybe a bit of time off now with her daughter is not a terrible idea. Although she's she was there in the press conference saying, do this for my legacy. And Dana White's there saying, we're going to turn around real fast. Uh, I think she's gotten to the stage now where Mighty Mouse Johnson was when he was taking on the likes of John Moraga and Chris Carriasso. You know what I mean, like decent level martial artist, but not world champion caliber. And I think she's at that cave stage now where like she'll be looking at your Aspen lads, Juliana Pena. She'll be looking, you know, further down the list of people, you know, to get two wins to string together to get a fight. But <laughs> like 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 Mike's like Mike said, uh, I do think Durandme and Shevchenko are the best options available for but again, we've already seen that play out. And I think UFC from what I'm hearing, looks to be going along the links of uh, uh, Wei Li Jing, or I think I think I said that right, oh, versus it, yeah. Shevchenko uh, for a super fight there before Shevchenko goes up to do the super fight with uh, Amanda Nunes. So who knows? Maybe she'll just be given another victim. Um, but I think a bit of time off might actually give one of the contenders a chance to you know build something for themselves. Yeah, but the thing is, Ross, right? Like her, her. I think that is she married? Yeah. Um, yeah. Nina, well, she's with Nina, Nina Ansaroff. Yeah, okay. Well, we'll say her partner at least is yeah. uh, Nina Ansaroff, who, who's also a UC fighter. So she lives in the gym. You know, she like, it, like even when she's off, Nina's about to fight. It's just like she can't, it, like she, she can't just like not be around it as well. So and like she's the goat as well. So I think she's just gonna sit around and keep killing people off. Like why wouldn't you when you're the goat? You know, <laughs> and you yeah, not much cash, if you, especially if you, you don't actually get touched. You know what I mean? Like she, she might be. You know what? Now that, now that I think about it, now that she is a mother, she might go, you know what, I made a cool million there and I wasn't even touched. I, I can just keep on making these millions without getting myself injured, so line them up. Line them up? Why not? Like, money's hard to find. Not if you're Amanda Nunes. <laughs> yeah, if you're not Amanda Nunes. But, uh, yeah, where does Megan Anderson go from here before we get into the bantamweights, lads? Um, uh, probably, probably, she'd probably go off to, like, the PFL or something like that and try and fight Kayla Harrison. I, I think like, that could be an interesting option at uh, 155. Um, but to be honest, she's hanging around till um, 
Man Nunez retires before she gets another title shot. Lad? I totally agree. Um, I think I think Megan's obviously incredibly marketable, um, and I think she is a good fighter, but when you don't have a ranking in that division, when there's not much of a roster to put there, um, what can you do? So I do like that, the PFL uh, route. I think that would be good, but if, if I was Megan, and I think what she will end up doing, it's just staying in the UFC, hanging around, um, taking the fights when a, a genuinely decent opponent comes up. And if they can ever obviously get a ranking together, I think she'll be up there, up, up in the top five of it. Um, but I think she just has to wait around for a little while and uh, take whatever fight she's given. And then when when Nunes retires, try and get that title fight. Mike? If I was Anderson, I would try and get over to Bellator and make the fight which she was originally signed to the UFC to come and do and go and try and get the cyborg fight. You know, it's probably not a bad idea. I mean, <laughs> Megan Anderson does leave uh, the 145-pound division. You know what I mean? You might as well retire that division because, you know, a half of Amanda Nunes' fights at 145 have been people who are actually 135-pounders, but, they, you know, they're willing to fight away for, for a belt. Um, yeah, so Amanda Nunes, the GOAT. There you have it, lads. Um, Undisputed. Um, Basmo, give us, give, us the, give us the bantamweight uh, lowdown. Yeah, okay, so for people that didn't see, Peter Yan was disqualified against Aljamain Sterling in the fourth round with a legal knee. Um, where do we even start here? Why, why did he do the knee? He was winning. Why did he do? Peter, oh, Jan, why did you do the knee? Oh, <laughs> uh, but the, for the first time in UFC history, someone has lost their title via disqualification. Um, apparently, Khabib told Daniel Cormier, this is a game of Chinese whisper, lads, that... Uh, won the Russian cornerman in Peter Yan's corner, told him to throw the knee. And it actually showed that um, John Boy and one of the English-speaking um, cornermen actually were saying, just punches, just punches. Um, it was, I'm not going to lie, I was very entertained by the fight. Um, I thought Aljamain Sterling showed some unbelievable striking in the early on going rounds. And then I thought Peter Yan showed incredible grappling. But, you know, um, we were left with so many unanswered questions. I think on the scorecards, two judges had a 29-28 to Jan. One had a 29-28 to Sterling. I think we all agree that Jan was going to win the fourth round um, for whatever 40 seconds were left. And he probably would have went on to win the fifth round. Sterling looked like he'd uh, blew his load. But, Mike, what was your take on the fight? Probably, could we think of any more of a frustrating situation? It because I was thinking about this a little bit earlier. If the tables were turned, think about it like this: if the tables were turned and Sterling being three three rounds down to one, potentially, as we as we mentioned, Gast and maybe look more than likely to lose the fifth, had the illegal in these knees, Jan, then we could go. Oh well, you know, the at least the right person won in the end. It's quite clear where the fight was going. It was quite clear with thirty seconds left, Jan Sterling needed the stoppage. It's just, it's unfathomable. And I think, as you mentioned there, Ross, it's, we've exposed a loophole, a loophole has been exposed as to the debate as to whether the the title should carry over for a disqualification loss. Yeah, this is like WWE and you get a count out, isn't it, Jake? And that's the <laughs> bottom line. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. Um, you put it well, unfathomable. Like, I, it literally sapped my energy out of me because I, I was genuinely enjoying the fight. And then when that happened, and even you heard them kind of discuss before that Sterling will get the belt if he can't continue to fight. I remember just thinking, it's going to happen like that. And I, this is just everything. I was enjoying such a good fight. And I, I, I thought it was a little bit more one-sided to Jan. I thought he was doing a lot better. Um, I, I didn't really get that one of the judges gave it to Sterling. Um, but as I said, I thought it was a brilliant match. And then just for it to end like that was, as I said, it just sapped everything that I was enjoying from that fight. I don't necessarily think it's a hard one. I do think Jan should be stripped because it was so intentional. But equally, I don't think that's a way to win a title. And I think that Jan, that rematch has to be made. Um, obviously, one of the biggest debates that came from it was if Sterling was faking it. Um, and I know that's something that quite a lot of people were angry about. And for both ways, that some people who were saying he was faking it, other, others were saying that's ridiculous. And then other people were saying that he was faking it and, and that it's ridiculous that he should fake it. For me, um, I think the fight should have been stopped. No doubt about that. I think that that knee was very clean and 
if he had got up afterwards and got knocked out straight away, I think that would have played a part in it. But at the same time, I do think we had all heard it before, Mark Smith saying that he will get the title here. Um, I think what did run through Sterling's mind as well was that he is out of this fight. He's not going to get back into it. So take this. He'll get the title for it. And probably the rematch will be made there. Um, and he gets a, he gets another chance. Because as you said, in the first few rounds, he looked brighter. So he gets a chance to come back and and put a different performance on. Ross, I'm going to put it on you now. Did Sterling do exactly what Jake says? Because I think Jake's on something there. I think it's a bit of a funny one to say he was acting. But I'm going to put it this way. He made the best choice for his career there and then in the moment. He was in there against a Russian killer that was not going to let up. Peter Yan is relentless, and he was getting better as the fight went on. That was becoming more, more and more one-sided. Uh, he had an absolute moment of madness, a moment of stupidity. He landed the illegal blow. Sterling was given the way out. And also, you have to take into account, when he's told he's given the title, when they do rematch, Aljamain Sterling is in line for a far larger payday. And also, he's in, large, in line to earn some pay-per-view points as well. So his, he, he could earn three or four times the amount of money he was earning at that pay-per-view on, his net, on, on the rematch. And also, he was probably going to lose the fight. Now he's got a rematch. Now he's got a chance to, you know, if he can improve his cardio and he can put in, in the performance that he was doing in the first and second round the whole way throughout the fight, it could be much more competitive. So, so you think he played the game correctly? I think, I don't think he should have continued. I think whether he was as knocked out as he was uh, or as knocked out as he was said to be, I don't know. Um, I thought, if he was going to say he couldn't continue, he probably shouldn't have done an interview like 30 seconds after the fight. I don't think that played into his favor with the audience. But at the end of the day, we're going to see a rematch between two of the best phantom weights in the world. And uh, also, I think they should definitely put on that card, Corey Santagan and TJ Dillashaw, and let's have the four best phantom weights in the world battle it out. Yeah, Mike, what do you make of that? The way at the end, Sterling left the belt in the octagon, and then later on that night, he was like, "Yeah, the belt, lads." <laughs> <laughs> it felt slightly hollow, was it? I think continuing on from what the two lads have said, I would characterize it as exaggerating the effects of the knee. I don't think we can say sit here without ever taking a knee like that and saying he wasn't stunned by it. In the same vein, I don't think I, I think he's exaggerated it. Having said that, my biggest issue is with the referee, to be honest, because what I think often happens is we see referees confer with the doctor or confer with the fight in themselves as to what the result of the fight will be should they say they can't continue. The doctor in this scenario has no, should have no agency over whether the fight continues or not. It should be a medical examination as to whether the fighter can continue. And I think that's the biggest problem is letting the fighter have a slight understanding as to what the outcome, the outcome. of his decision will be. Yeah, I, th I think that's definitely not a conversation you should have with the ref. Now, I think maybe you should be able to ask the referee what the outcome will be, and that'll be fine. But I don't think the ref should be like, man, if you don't get up, you'll win the world championship. It's like, wait, <laughs> I'm dead, lads, I'm dead. Get the casket, get the casket. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, no, you're definitely right, Mike. Uh, definitely, uh, I don't think the ref been like, if you stay down, man, you win. You know what I mean? Like he, he obviously needs to use the jacks or something. The ref did, so he was like, "Come on, lads, let's get this over with." Well, the question is, do we want to see a rematch, or what do you want to see next? Ross, you go first. Absolutely, make the rematch, book it ASAP. Um, let's get it on. I don't know UFC two sixty one, and let's get it going. The lads, you agree, or would you like to see Sterling fight someone else? Because he was, he was, he was going. Um... He did get a picture with Henry Cejudo after. I think we have Please to see no. the rematch. But the only thing I would say to you is I have I have a little bit of a theory when it comes to rematches when it's a close when it's a close draw or a immediate rematch. My opinion is always that the pace if if we the example I always use is Canelo versus Golovkin, and once a close fight like that is scored as a draw, the person who in everybody's eyes lost the fight knows what adjustments they need to make for the rematch. With that in mind, how much do you think Sterling's game plan will change in a potential rematch? 
in fairness, I think you can only increase his cardio. I think that was the best Aljamain Sterling we've ever seen. And I don't think it was the best Peter Yan we've ever seen. So yeah, if it was go three match, I favor Yan. What do you think, Jake? Um, I think the fight has to be made, the rematch. I think Yan, as I said, I think he was dominating the fight. For Sterling, I think if he didn't take that fight, I think it would be because he he doesn't want it because he was getting beaten. But at the same time, because of obviously it was the most blatant knee, it was it was beyond just a normal mistake. It was stupid at that level of game for a belt. I think you you've got to argue that potentially I can see how maybe the UFC would or even Sterling go. No, I don't want to give him the shot now because of that. Um, but as I said, for me, no doubt the fight should be made. Um, and I, I agree with you guys. Sterling knows what adjustments now he needs to make. Um, and I actually had Sterling beforehand. I predicted Sterling to win it because I thought he would. Um, Jan might then go in thinking, I've already beaten this guy three, maybe even four rounds. Um, he doesn't need to do much. And then Sterling comes in, completely refreshed, and, and dominates him. We'll have to see. But as I said, for me, there's no doubt that fight should be next. Basil, I don't know if you were talking to uh, John Boy after the fight, were you? Um, I no, no, I wasn't actually. No, no, I, I was, and uh, he was actually saying that Peter was actually severely affected that he had to move his camp over to ATT. He didn't actually get to train. He was getting used to new bodies, and that he wasn't actually uh, as comfortable as he normally would be. He'd fly his family over to Thailand and everything before his fight, and like that makes him happy and like it makes him more comfortable and he didn't have his family over in uh, Miami for this fight so he was saying that like mentally it was a tough camp for Peter Yan and he's saying that next time he'll have his family there and he'll be an absolute stone cold killer so like I, I, I believe him when he tells me that as well all right right lads before we get into this weekend's cards right um, I want you to tell me what fight or fighter on the, the week over the weekend's card really, really uh, impressed you. So, um, Ross, we'll start with yourself. What other fight or f- fighter really impressed you on the UC 259 card? Uh, I'm going to go really uh, close to the start of the night because uh, I'm not too sure who the lads are going to pick. But I was very, very impressed with uh, Sean Brady. He uh, managed to get the head and arm choke in on um, Jake Matthews. And, you know... Jake Matthews is a UFC vet at this stage, but Brady is undefeated. He looks like a massive prospect at welterweight, and he is an absolute gorilla. The size of that man's back is huge, <laughs> and I, I am very much looking forward to see what he can do in, in the welterweight division. I would not be surprised to see him in the rankings after another fight. Okay, lads, who wants to go next? How oh, far away? Um, I agree. With the Brady fight, that was phenomenal. Um, it was a fight that previously I'd said on another podcast that literally these two, whoever wins this, I think are going to go on to great things. Because you have to take someone like Matthews as well. I think that was his 22nd pro fight at like 26, 27 years old. Um, I thought Brady's performance was awesome. But my favourite fight was the Kyler Phillips fight with Song Yadong. Um, I think the performance Phillips put on was awesome. I think even moments in the fight like that head kick, how on earth Yadong didn't go down. I think it had a lot in the fight. Um, and I think now we also see a guy at 135 pounds who is a serious danger um, and someone who's going to be, I think, within the next two or three fights, top five and hopefully pushing into the title in, in, in a couple of years' time. Okay. Um, Mike, what about yourself? I would go with the Kennedy and Zetchiku come from behind kind of win against Carlos Solberg. Carlos Solberg, obviously, teammate of Adesanya. So I think anybody who's coming out of that camp has got a little bit of heat on the name. Uh, and Zetchiku was hit by a lot of volume, but done quite a good job of absorbing punches or taking punches on his guard and then comes back with a come from behind victory. He's slightly more um, slightly more of a veteran's UFC career. And I think whenever he steps in there, you are guaranteed a little bit of a little bit of action and a, generally speaking, a good fight. I actually think in, in Denshiq actually set a record for uh, worst fight differential in light heavyweight history and still winning the fight. So uh, <laughs> fair play to him. Basma, what about you? Right. I, I thought what he was, was going to say is on Makachev because uh, we have to speak about him, but also Dominic Cruz as well, winning by split decision and then calling out Hans Molenkamp, the, the owner or the face of Monster Energy. So um, that would be interesting to see. But uh, lads, Islam Makachev, like, there's been so much talk about him. 
uh, people, Daniel Cormier was saying that if you want to get Khabib out of retirement, you have to, you should face Islam Makachev win and then call out Khabib. So lads, Islam Makachev, who would you like to see him fight next? I think him versus Tony Ferguson is the match to make. We didn't get Khabib versus Tony Ferguson. Let's have Islam Makachev versus Tony Ferguson. I would very much so fancy Islam Makachev to win that fight, but let's build Islam Makachev up. He beat a very good game, Drew Dober. He really dominated him in the second. And you know what? I don't know uh, whether people watching saw the fight or not, but he actually had no right to get that choke from the position he did. And his squeeze was intense. I actually thought Drew Dover's head was going to pop off. It was <laughs> so tight. Mike, what's, what's, what's next for Islam? I, I like the Ferguson fight, but at this point, I, I would like maybe Tony to get one more when it feels... I'll just say, I don't want to be... Feels a little bit like a, a little bit like he's feeding the wolves. So I'm going to go slightly different and go Benil Dariush. I think it'll be an interesting fight on the ground. Dariush has very good striking. I would argue slightly better striking than Islam, perhaps. So I think that would be a great fight and the real litmus test for Makhachev. Good show. Jake? I, both them fights. I, I think both end fights are awesome. Um, I'm more inclined to the Ferguson fight because I do think Makhachev. He's had some time off um, in the past and he hasn't really been able to kind of get that the volume of fights he would need to be in that top five. But I think that Ferguson fight would put him there. And I think obviously Ferguson coming off two losses now, why not make that? Um, it depends if that's the type of fight Ferguson wa- wants to make because I would agree it's feeding him to the Wolves. But also if he takes that fight and beats him, then he proves that he's, he's still up there. And I think that's the challenge that Ferguson needs to set as well. Yeah, it would make people very excited for that fight as well. Basman, who you want to fight? I, I just the Tony Ferguson one. I think is just very exciting. You, you can just picture Tony Ferguson talking to Khabib outside the octagon, being like, "What's you call him again? What's he called, Khabib?" The tiramisu. The eagle. <laughs> no, oh, oh yeah, tiramisu. tiramisu. <laughs> you know what? What's called, Khabib, Khabib was looking thicker than a Snickers did there uh, on uh, Saturday night. I was like, "Fuck hell!" You know, he's, he'd be up in the light heavyweight division there the way he's eating. That yeah, tiramisu yeah. was on top. <laughs> <laughs> okay okay uh, right lads before we get into this weekend's card make sure to like make sure to subscribe also what would you rate the card out of 10 uh, Ross you go first I'm going to give it uh, 8 out of 10 uh, in terms of like name recognition in terms of you know fights going into the card for me it was a 10 like it was an MMA f- uh, fan's dream but uh, I think you know Piotr Jan may, um, what's called um, Megan Anderson's performance and then I think Stoyle Bender I, I thought he could have done a bit more to look for a finish himself. So I'm going to give it an eight, but uh, I was very entertained. What about yourself, Mike? I would go seven out of 10. Slightly lackluster. It, as you mentioned, some of the some of the matches were fantastic, but slightly lackluster in terms of the obviously finish with the Jan Sterling fight. The Nunes fight didn't go as long as... Well, he certainly wasn't challenged. And mm. as I mentioned earlier, the whole point of the champ champ idea wasn't really fulfilled, so I would go slightly uh, disappointing 7 out of 10. I'm going to go right in between you guys and just say 7.5. I, <laughs> I, <think, laughs> I was going to say that as well. <laughs> well I've stolen that space. Um, no, I, I think on paper it's a 10 out of 10 card, so you kind of got to work from 10 and going down, and I think it was them three title fights really that just didn't have, didn't deliver from what the earlier part of the night had, had, had done. Um, I 10 out of 10 prelims, Jake, what were they? Yeah, the, honestly, the, the first part of the card, obviously in the UK, we all get tired on, on these UFC cards. I yeah. wasn't tired at any point. I was literally watching it, enjoying it. Um, and I think, obviously, as I said, it was just it was the title fights, the calibre of fights they were. I kind of wanted a little bit more from them, um, which is why I, I think I got seven and a half, a good card, um, but not in the rankings of, of UFC 244, UFC 239, those cards where you just look back and just... Basmo, you have a free hit. You can give whatever you want now. You don't have to stay in between the lines. You can give your yeah, honest opinion. Well, just in the build-up to the card, it was like it was 10 out of 10 in the build-up. Um, obviously, That's only because you were on the countdown, man. <laughs> yeah, but no, that made 11 out of 10. But just like looking at it, how excited I was coming off the Kamaru Usman win, that card wasn't that amazing. But like I, I give it a... It was definitely... Okay, I guess 7.6 just to move it up a tiny bit. But uh, lads, this weekend, we were meant to have Leon Edwards versus uh, Kazma Chimaev, who actually announced he retired, but Dana's like, it's not happening. So Khabib's not allowed to retire. Chimaev is not allowed to retire. But Leon Edwards is taking on Bil- uh, Bilil Muhammad in the welterweight division. 
Um, lads, this was one of the main reasons why we wanted to get you on because obviously Leon Edwards, he's from Birmingham, and then Darren Stewart, he's from well, he's from is he from London? Yes. All right. Yeah, that, that's that's a fight not to miss against Eric Anders as well. But lads, we'll start the, we'll start at the very top, and then we can pick out a couple of fights as well that you like. Leon Edwards, he's finally back in action, taking on Bilal Muhammad Ross. How excited are you for Leon Edwards? Yeah, I'm very excited to see Leon Edwards back. I I always look at Leon Edwards, and I sort of call him almost like a, a disabler. You know what I mean? Like he actually like shuts his opponents down. Um, he does excellent work up against the fence. He's a beautiful striker. His ground game is even still underrated after he put on an absolute clinic against someone like Gunnar Nelson. He Don't forget the elbows, the, man. And, and, the, and Basmo, you love his elbows. He is one of the best welterweights in the world. Um, I'm very excited to see him back. What I preferred against a slightly higher-ranked opponent. Yeah, but look, Belil uh, Muhammad is an absolute grinder. Um, he'll, he'll make this a fight. He has the cardio to go the five rounds. Um, I can see it being quite one-sided. Uh, I don't know if Leon will actually get the finish because Belil is very, very tough. But I am very excited to see Leon, Rocky Edwards back. The Jamaican sensation. <laughs> uh, Mike, what, what's the sort of feedback from the, the English media, the English MMA media surrounding Leon Edwards? Every, like, because... Not many people were talking about him. Then almost all of a sudden, like Kazmat, like he was meant to fight Kazmat, and this like blew him up. Like, what's the sort of feedback now? Um, I can't give you much of an opinion on the English MMA either in the totality, to be candid. But from in my opinion, I'm happy. I'm really happy that he's back. Um, I think it was a there was a, there could have been a missed opportunity uh, when the Kamzat fight fell out again. For him to stay off the card, I think it's good for him to be back in action. I believe he's he'll have been out of action for twenty months, so it's good to see him back. And I also think with Leon's fighting style, I think he'll have leveled up from the last time we saw him. It, my belief is that ring rust is more for a slightly less technical, a bit more of a a, a brawler or you know a fighter, if you like. I think how technical Leon is, we will see him levels above. And I'm predicting a as you mentioned there, Ross, a wide decision victory yeah jake obviously leon's been doing some amazing things during covid um he was like helping uh, along with other english mma uh, mixed martial artists uh, trying to take people and tell people not to be carrying knives and all this sort of stuff when all the chaos was going on but uh, how excited are you for the return of leon edwards absolutely mate um the edwards brothers get some hard slack um in 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 sport in general I think, because I was at UFC London when he fought Nelson, literally fans didn't cheer him. Um, and I think that is also partially because Nelson is a UK favourite. Um, but I think also because like, it was sort of, you were either on his side or down, down to Hill's side yeah, at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that did play into it. For me, um, the Edwards brothers are two of the most marketable in the sport. I think they're awesome. I think what they do is brilliant. And I think their skill sets are amazing. I would love to see them both as champions of, of, of the sports in different promotions. Um, I think they do so much for the sport and for their communities. Uh, they're training at one of the best gyms in the world. Renegade Jiu-Jitsu is genuinely awesome. Some of their stars they have are brilliant and they drill hard. Literally, been down there a few times and their set up, everything about them is great. They're a great little family there. Um, and I'm not going to lie, when this fight was made, I, I never agreed with the Chamaya fight. I thought they were selling Edwards out there. I thought, I, I, I get that Chimaev's incredible and I get that, that he is a super fight anyway, despite not being in the rankings. I just felt that Edwards didn't deserve that fight. I thought he was deserving the title shot. Um, so then when this Mohammed fight was made, I was a little bit disappointed again. I thought, why are they doing this to Leon? But then I saw Leon actually put out there saying he really respects um, Bilal for this and basically thanking him for taking the opportunity. So hats off to them both. I think it's going to be an awesome fight. Um, but I do think Edwards exemplifies all Mohammed's skills just better. Um, so I think I think we'll see a, a five round decision, um, but I think it will go fully every round to Edwards. Do you think that um, Aaron from Geordie Shore retiring is that has affected Leon's career, Jake? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I, I like Aaron. Try not to laugh there. Like. It's, so do I. So do I. I just didn't realize his uh, career needed a retirement post. I just thought it was funny. Oh, did he actually retire? Yeah. 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 Oh, I didn't see that. Well, so, so you saying that I 
I like Aaron. I, th- I think him joining the sport was a good thing, especially for UK mixed martial arts. I think. Yes, like, I agree. Bringing some fans to the sport that wouldn't have been here before, that was a great thing. But what I didn't like was seeing other journalists out there going, oh, it's a sad day for the sport. It's a shame. But I, I don't know about that. I think, I think fair play to me. He tried something out. I think he did well. Aaron's got hands. Like, he throws well. Hmm. But whether it's a sad day for the sport, not I think it was a bit of a non-story for me, but like I just thought, I just thought, as we're on on the uh, to, uh, team of Team Renegade, I thought I had to ask. Mm, absolutely, no. yeah. No, Aaron's, like, what, Aaron's what, sound. Aaron's sound. So was Leon. We met him a couple of times as well. Very, very like, what was your, what was your ta- thoughts on uh, Aaron uh, Chalmers' return? I didn't give it much thought, but on his career, um, so you know, so far or up to this point, I thought he did it, did it the right way. He didn't do the Jake Paul slash Logan Paul mm. thing. And, fight people who aren't prepared to get in the ring or fight people with hit replacements. He went in there and he, he had a go and he took some wins and he took some losses. And I, I don't know, I can't speak much of the calibre of his opposition, but they were professionals. So fair play to him and, you know, I wish him the best. Yeah, just let him bang, bro. Let him bang, bro. <laughs> let him bang, bro. Uh, lads, any other fight on this card that you're looking forward to seeing? Oh, but just keep that in the back of your mind. Eric Anders is taking on Darren, Darren Stewart in the middleweight division. Ross, what are you sort of expecting from this? These lads can bang, bro. I actually think we should go to Mike on this because I think Mike had uh, Eric Anders on his podcast there maybe last week. Yeah, so, so I've had the opportunity to actually speak with both of them quite recently. I got I spoke to Darren the night of night after UFC 256, which was the night Kevin Holland knocked out Jack Array and subsequently called out Stewart in the press conference. And Darren was talking to me about he wants he felt a little bit disrespected because he was consistently getting guys off the contender series or guys debuting in the in the promotion. And I actually spoke to him the other day and said, is this the fight that you were talking about? You want a more respected name in the division? He said, yeah, this is the type of guy that I want to be fighting. And I haven't spoke to Eric, as you mentioned, Ross. Eric, I, relayed, I relayed that to Eric and he said, yeah, this feels a little bit like to me, whoever, whilst we're both kind of becoming veterans, whoever wins this fight takes a big step forward. Maybe not into a ranked opponent next, but certainly, you know, established themselves as being a problem in the division. So I'm very, look, very much looking forward to this one. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I think it's like almost the people's main event, uh, this one. Uh, Eric Anders, you know, the Alabama slammer. He's, uh, he's always there to put on a show. And look, Darren Stewart, you know, he hasn't been given um, an easy ride whatsoever since he's got into the UFC. You know, he lost a split decision to Edmund Shabazian, who's still one of the top uh, touted prospects in the middleweight division. You know, he went on, beat Bevan Lewis and Darren Wynn, and then, you know, lost in Cage Warriors because, but like, that was in the midst of COVID, and, you know, he was just looking to get it, put some bread on the table, as you might say. Uh, then he beat Coconut Bombs, Mackie Patolo, uh, and then, you know, he lost Kevin Holland in the split decision. So, like, look, these sort of fights, you know what I mean? He's fighting some of the best guys in his division, and I actually think technically he is better than Eric Anders. I think Eric Anders is literally just a brawler. Now, it does work for him a lot of the times, but I think Darren Stewart, uh, he offers a bit more technique, and I think he's actually also better on the ground as well, which I think we might see in this fight. I agree. I think um, I think Stewart's all-around MMA game is stronger than Anders is. I do think Anders might have that edge on power. Um, don't get me wrong, Stuart can throw down, but I think if Anders catches him, he's going to be in a bit of trouble. Um, but overall, I think Stuart has had a bit of a hard run in the, in the sport so far, or in the UFC at least. But he's one of them guys that in the UK he's loved, um, and he's heavily involved with people like Cage Warriors. So he's going to remain in the sport. He's going to always be circling that top 15 yeah. as long as he's fighting. Um, and I, I, I think if you get a London card, you've got to put him on it, you've got to put him on the main card. He's a guy who wants more. We've spoken about a lot today, but he's marketable. Um, and I think this is a good fight. Uh, you mentioned, obviously, the fight with Maki Patolo, and Patolo can throw down as well. So if we get to see Stuart get a guy in there who, as I said, isn't as experienced as him or might not have a, a, a well-rounded game, um, if he can go in there and put in an absolute performance, a 30-27 domination, I think then we might see him try and enter that top 15 again and uh, go on a little bit of a spree. All right, lads. What other fight or fighter on the card are you looking forward to seeing this weekend so that people know who to check out? Uh, Ross, you can go first, but... Um, 
I'm going to go with my mate, Big Ben Rothwell. I love Big Ben Rothwell. Uh, I met him in Dublin uh, at UFC fight night. Was it the McGregor Brandale one? And yeah. uh, he gave me a t-shirt. So, uh, <laughs> And you're still wearing it to this day, man. Yeah, I still wear it to this day. Me and Big Ben, uh, we go back a while. So uh, I'm going to say Big Ben Rothwell. Okay. Mike. Uh, Mike. I would like to go with the fight, not not so much the person, but the fight between Davy Grant and Jonathan Martinez. I'm quite good friends with Davy Grant. He's a uh, very friend. nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ooh, whatever, fighter friend. whatever, whatever other word you'd like me to use, I'll use. I love that. the way Ross, you, you said you're best mates with Ben Rothwell, and then Mike says one thing, and you're like friend. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's initiation. It's his first time on the it show. Is. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and plus. <laughs> All, all lads from Liverpool love taking a bit of stick. Yeah, we do, yeah. <laughs> yeah. On, yeah. Grant. Um, yeah, Grant is um Grant's two two fight win streak of memory serves. He he was the uh, he, he was the first fight on Fight Island. Uh he knocked out Martin Day in the third round and Martinez fighting out of Factory X Muay Thai. His last fight was a decision win over Thomas Almeida. I'd say it's probably his best performance to date. I think it's just gonna be a real Back and forth, bantam weight fight. Betting line favors Martinez, but I think Grant is definitely in this one. Okay. And Jake, what about yourself? Uh, for myself, I picked the 145 pound fight between Dan EJ and um, Billy, uh, not Billy, sorry, Gavin Tucker. So I was going to say, Gavin's, Gavin, so far in the sport, looks amazing. 13 and 1, last time out, unanimous decision over um, Billy Quantanillo. I think he looks brilliant, but. EJ for me is one of them guys who every time he steps in that octagon, he looks brilliant. Um, despite the fact he's had a couple of losses recently, I think he's awesome. Um, I think he, he, well, the first time I saw him was when he fought in London, and I can't remember who it was against, but he just smashed through him. Yeah, Scottish lad. Danny Henry. Yeah, he looked brilliant in that fight. And I think since then, he's, he's kind of proven that he is up there with the best. I would love to see the winner of that face, uh, the winner of Shane Burgos and Edson Barbosa. I think they're both awesome fights. Um, I know EJ obviously and Barbosa have had their fight, but for me, the winner of Tucker and EJ and the winner of Burgos and, and, and Barbosa are going to be up there to push them to that top 10 and hopefully go on a bit of a spree because I think they're all awesome fighters. Um, and this is, I think it's one of the fights that's a little bit undersold. I think, yeah, I, think other- EJ's, I think EJ only fought Barbosa two fights ago. And uh, what's it called? I think he beat him, and then he lost Calvin Carter. So yeah. well, he's, he's, he's definitely, he's definitely, he's. Pardon? Sorry, I was going to say about the Cater fight. A lot of people wrote that fight off or, yeah. or overlooked it, and it put on an absolutely amazing performance. Yeah. It was arguably one of the most kind of, not, I wouldn't say fight fight of the year, but at least a performance yeah. where you go, if you want someone to watch a good fight, go back and look at that. And I think that's what EJ brings to most of his bouts. Yeah, I, don't, I think he does look very, very promising. And I think he is sort of, look, he's not going to be easy for anyone at 145 pounds. So I do agree with that. Basmo. Yeah, Can I just mention something before we oh, move on? on? Yeah. Yeah, uh, no, it's just just on that point, Jake. I actually got to speak to Eric Nixer, head coach of EGA, last week. We talked a little bit about the scheduled Ryan Hall fight. And Eric said they haven't actually been preparing for Ryan Hall as much as they have, but they had a feeling he might pull out. So I asked him, who he thinks is a harder matchup for Ige, uh, Ryan Hall or Gavin Tucker, and they actually said Gavin Tucker, which I would be inclined to agree with. I don't know. I don't know about you guys. I, I just think Ryan Hall is such a unique talent that I'm like, look, if you can keep it off the mat, you could have a handy night. But once it goes to the mat, geez, you might take your, it might take your leg home with you. So mm. uh, like, you know, I mean, put it this way. <laughs> He, he, you could end up with potential very long-term uh, damage to your career if he grabs one of those legs. But if you can keep him on the feet, you might have one of the best nights of your life. <laughs> True, yeah. Uh, one person I'm looking out for is in the co-main event, Ryan Spann. Uh, we had Sam Alvion for UFC 249. I think it was Ross, wasn't it? And then yeah. Sam actually Sam actually lost. And then ever since then, it's just sort of like Ryan Spann is someone I'm keeping an eye on. But... Uh, Lads, that sort of wraps up the show. Um, Basmo, I think I think we should do one uh, last question, just in yeah. relation to Leon Edwards. Uh, we'll start with yourself, Mike. If Leon does win, does he get a title shot? Yes or no? My, in a purest world, yes, but I'm just not sure if he's marketable enough. So and are you lean towards no? 
I'm leaning towards no because I look at the division and I look at how close Kamaru and Ali are to the UFC brass and I think that they really want that hard of a matchup with that little of a reward. Having already beat them, I personally think they will do whatever they can to not get Lee on a title shot, in my honest opinion. Jake? Yeah, I don't think that fight's made either. Um, I think, arguably, obviously, because it's a guy like Mohamed, I don't think you can warrant a title shot after that. Um, I think they might be eyeing up the Masvidal fight. I think that's something that everyone wants to see after their history together. Whether Masvidal obviously gets Usman next, but I would like to see the Masvidal-Edwards um, fight made. And I think that if Edwards wins that, you cannot, you cannot deny him a title shot. I think he deserves it anyway, but I don't think it's the next fight. Basmo? No, I agree with the lads. I think he needs to get, he needs to beat someone in the top five or top six. He needs someone in the top six to accept his challenge as well. So if he goes out a knockout this weekend, or maybe he's best off winning by decision, they're like, ah, I'll, I'll beat him easily. You know, maybe you have to sort of play the game as Sterling did. Well, the best Birmingham has to offer the Jamaican sensation, Leon Rocky Edwards. I'm going to say he's going to win and he's going to call his shot. He's going to ask the title fight. And I think there could be a bit of recency bias in there. The other lads haven't fought for a while. Uh, Masvidal and Covington, they might be out of favour. And I'm going to say Leon Rocky Edwards. I'm going to be the optimist and say he gets his long-awaited title shot with a win come Saturday night. Yeah! <laughs> so that's it, lads. Uh, okay, before we go, uh, we're, you just sort of shout out your stuff, how people can check you out. Mike, you go first, bud. Yep, uh, Mike Owens Media on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, and most likely, most probably best to, to try and find me on Instagram. And I just want to thank you two, you two for the for the time on your show. It's very much appreciated, and I, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> cheers, it's it. Cheers, Jake, the famous Jake Jones. If you see him around Leeds, say all right. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> uh, guys. Thank you so much. Obviously, having me back on the show It's always a pleasure. Um, you find myself online, Twitter and Instagram at Jake Jones MMA, or uh, we're running Ultimate MMA at the moment. So that's a weekly podcast that we're trying to kind of push out there. So any support on that would also be great. But as I said, lads, you have me on here. That's support enough. So appreciate it. Love it. There you go, Bazmo. I was actually on the phone to Baz yesterday and I was saying, I love to form a sort of UK and Ireland sort of MMA round table. And uh, we like what you guys do. So I was like, right, well, we'll have the boys on for a show. And especially like after a big event to sort of break down um, all the fights and you don't have someone on who goes, sorry, who's Peter O'Yan? You know what I mean? <laughs> so it's nice to have lads on who, you know, are actively watching and they're growing as hard as we are. So yeah. uh, guys, thanks a million for your time for coming on. Um, and, you know, I always say, hopefully we can all grow and make it to the top together. Um, Basmo, any final words? No, lads, make sure to get the speedos ready for Fight Island when we get when we're allowed to go. Uh, <laughs> make sure to follow the lads, make sure to like, make sure to comment, make sure to subscribe. And as always, stay, stay energized. energized. <laughs>